A very warm welcome to you all for logging in this evening to listen to the next in our series of webinars. Uh, my name is Tracy Evans and I am currently the course director at CTT in London. Tonight's guest is Edwina Gray. Edwina is a senior tutor and co course coordinator on our current foundation trainings. Um, before working as a craniosacral therapist, Edwina was a television producer. Her passion is horses. She grew up with horses. She runs a, a busy equine practice from her farm in Kent, as well as running a busy human practice from her farm in Kent. Um, and she also co-runs um, a postgraduate biodynamic craniosacral therapy equine training. I've worked with Edwina for a number of years and it's, it's always a great pleasure. She's a component part of our team here at CTT and we all love her dearly. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce to you this evening, Edwina Gray. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you and uh, welcome everybody. Um, Thank you for joining and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank CTET um, for this evening. Um, so welcome. I have to say it's a little strange for me to sit in front of a computer and talk about my work with horses. I'm used to being outside with a horse present, but I'm really excited to share with you um, my work, uh, my biodynamic craniosacral therapy work. Um, horses and biodynamic craniosacral therapy are two of my greatest passions. Um, this webinar is mainly only at craniosacral therapists, so I will be talking about cranial principles and I will be using some cranial terminology. And I am aware that for some people that won't be so familiar, but I hope it will still be of interest and an opportunity for you to learn more about equine biodynamic craniosacral therapy. So let me um, start with a little overview of um, my background with horses. So I'm just going to share my screen here with you. So here is um, a little montage of some horses that have been past and present in my life. I've been very lucky to have horses in my life all my life. I grew up with them. I think I was first put on a horse when I was about two or three. And I can still remember that feeling as a child of being connected to such a large animal and, and feeling that really deeply and, and a real need to be close to them. Um, they've given me a great amount of pleasure in my life. Um, I was certainly one of those pony mad little girls who was craning her neck to see any pony whenever I could get near it. Um, about 30 years ago, this would have been very typical of me riding. Um, I was often out competing, I was enjoying my horses, I was enjoying the buzz that I got from being with them. But when I reflect back now, I'm not sure that I was as connected as I thought I was at the time. I certainly wasn't um, noticing their well-being on a level that I can do now through my craniosacral skills, and I think I was probably missing quite a lot. I have to say over the last 10 to 15 years, this bottom right picture is a bit more um, of how I am now with my horses. I've spent a lot of time studying horse psychology, horse anatomy and physiology, and working energetically with horses so that I can have much more of an energetic connection with them and not need um, so much tack because I'm connecting with them on a much deeper level of their being. I also have the privilege of working with other people's horses a lot of the time now. Um, I get to connect with them very deeply and really listen to the essence of their being and it's, it's never short of a great privilege. And I actually trained in biodynamic craniosacral therapy because of a horse and I'd really like to just acknowledge her now. So this is Dream. She was a little new forest pony um, many years ago, ago, she belonged to my daughter. She was my daughter's little riding pony. And she was a great pony, um, really good fun. My daughter had a lot of great times with her. And one day I came home at the farm where I live and she was out in the field. And I looked out across the fields and she didn't look quite right to me. So I went out to see her 
And when I got round to the far side of her, I could see she'd had a terrible accident. Um, she had caught her neck and had um, a deep laceration through her neck muscles. She had cut her side down to the bones of her rib and she was in a really poor way. Um, so of course, the first thing we did was call the vet immediately. And she went off to the vets and um, they were amazing. Uh, she had a four hour operation and they basically saved her life. And over the next sort of three months, she slowly healed. And um, we looked after her, she became physically, physically well. And the time came when it was right to ride her again. So we went to put a saddle on her, but something had changed. She was much more stressed, she was much more ang anxious. She actually turned to bite me, which was something she had never done before. So that was a clear message that she wasn't okay. And I thought, well, if, I, if she can't take the saddle, then I for sure can't put my daughter on her back. Um, so, you know, now what do I do? And a few weeks later, I happened to be talking to a friend and she said to me, oh, I know somebody who practices biodynamic craniosacral therapy with horses and you could give that a go. Um, so I rang a wonderful practitioner, um, Hilary Phillips. She trained at CTET many years ago, wonderful horsewoman. And uh, she came along to treat Dream. At the time, I knew nothing about biodynamics. So it seemed to me that um, this very light touch, this very light hands-on therapy that she was doing, wasn't actually doing what I was used to seeing being done to horses in a kind of mechanical way. But there was clearly an effect on Dream. Dream set settled so deeply, I don't think I'd ever seen her look so settled and still. And something was clearly changing. Um, Hilary came back for a second session. And after the end of that second session, Dream was completely back to normal. Um, no aggression, no anxiety, clearly all the trauma that had been in her system was resolved and I was captivated. It just seemed amazing to me. So I went on an intro weekend at CTET and then I undertook the practitioner training and as Tracy mentioned, after a couple of years in practice, I joined the tutor team. And during that time, I've also developed a program with Penel Meredith for working post, a postgrad program for working cranially with horses. And also I've put together my own program for working with them day to day in practice. And that's something that um, I'm doing today. So I'm just gonna stop the screen. So I think that um, for craniosacral therapists, learning to work with horses can really support your human practice and it can really help refine your skills. Working with the horses is a great affirmation of our work. There's no placebos, it's non-verbal, and the feedback that we get from horses is very real and honest, and something that we really need to take note of when we're working with them. As a horse settles into a cranial session, the feedback that you might see would be that they will often lick and chew, which is how a horse will process something. They'll yawn a lot. Um, they'll get increased gut sounds. Sometimes they'll lie down, um, but also they'll really let you know if your intention and your intention is too great because they will just walk away. And it really opens you up and helps you to work within the wider fields of function. And I really think it helps those perceptive skills to develop as well. I find that I can feel in my hands from a horse's system much, much clearer than maybe I can in a human. And I think some of that is because horses are so embodied. They're very present. They're very much in their body and they're not being that cognitive a lot of the time. And I think that really helps us to feel um, when we're working cranially. The expressions of fluid motion and bone motility are just greater because they are bigger. And it's an exciting time to be talking about craniosacral therapy for horses. The horse world is transitioning towards a more holistic approach with horse psychology and whole horse therapies really emerging as valuable treatments alongside more traditional ways of supporting their health and well-being. Certainly in craniosacral therapy, we are working with the horse's system and we're not doing something to the system. So horses and humans have had a long connection that's worked both on a practical and an emotional level for many years. And I think one of the things that really draws us to them is that they connect us to nature. And they really need that connection to nature in order to feel physically 
and mentally and emotionally well. Horses are sentient beings. And although they are a flight animal, I think they actually really like to live very peacefully. They're obviously very physically strong, but they're also extremely sensitive. In fact, the whole of their body is actually as sensitive as our fingertips. As craniosacral therapists, we practice and work hard to enhance our sensitivity and our ability to perceive subtle energetics and fluid motion through our hands. But perception is very natural for horses. In fact, they're one of the most perceptive of all domestic animals. Perceiving energy is something they're masters of, and they are very sensitive even to the most gentle of vibrations. So I think it's this combination of qualities of sensitivity and strength that has drawn us to them over the centuries and created a really strong bond. There's of course a large practical element, particularly historically, but also horses teach us so much about ourselves. They're great reflectors of our own deep emotions. And it's one of the reasons why equine therapy for humans has become so popular and is so valuable. But for me, it's important that we don't just take from horses just to meet our kind of human desires. In order for our relationship with horses to be balanced and truly healthy, we must meet them on many levels too. And for me, that goes beyond the kind of basic care that we would provide any animal. So this includes craniosacral therapy, which is the whole horse therapy. Um, I'd like to just now do a little bit of an overview of some very basic horse um, anatomy. I'm keeping it pretty simple this evening. We go into a lot more depth in our postgrad training, but I'm just going to share a slide with you. Okay, so one of the ways that we can work cranially with horses is by supporting their health through the inherent intelligence of the tissues. So this includes the bones. So here we have a horse's skeletal system. And I think one of the things to notice here is that their cervical spine actually runs midway through their neck. It doesn't actually run along the top line as a lot of, a lot of people think. And a horse's cervical spine and tail have quite a lot of flexibility, but actually their thoracic vertebrae and lumbar vertebrae actually have very little movement and can only cope with sort of minor adjustments. And it needs to be that strong in order to hold this very large trunk which holds an awful lot of intestines, and that's very common in grazing animals. Um, their spine is very strong. Obviously, you know, we can, uh, we put a saddle on a horse and a rider, and when we do that, we really change the tensegrity and balance of a horse's system. And when we work cranially, we can actually feel the forces and the um, pressure in individual vertebrae as we work. So yeah, a horse's spine is not, this part of the spine is not that flexible. They couldn't curl up like a cat, for example. But they do have large spinous processes, so they can be up to 10 inches long here at the withers. We're also working cranially with the muscles and the fascia. So we'll be working with the deep and the superficial muscles. Particularly of interest is the neck. Um, those muscles get used a lot because the horse lowers and, and raises its head when it's grazing. Another area that I find particularly interesting to work cranially with is the fascia. So that's that kind of interweb of soft tissue that permeates the muscles and surrounds the bones and the organs. And I think it's um, interesting to work cranially because it responds so well to light, fascia responds really well to light touch. Um, certainly around the lumbosacral junction and the sacroiliac joints, those, those fascial connections there can get quite caught up, particularly in high performance horses and horses that do a lot of jumping. So here we have the organs of a horse. We talked about, just touched on the amount of intestines. It's about 60 to 70 feet worth of intestines that a horse has going on there. And a horse can't be sick, so it does need to have its intestines working really well. We can also tune into the fluids. So that would include the blood and the lymph. Um, a horse's heart is quite large and here. We can have a look at the circulatory system. And when we're working cranially, we're also working with the central nervous system and the spinal cord. 
And that's where I will notice the inherent fluctuations to the cerebrospinal fluid. And I like to get a sense of the quality of the potency here, because this will give me a good ind indication of the overall vitality of a horse's system. And so in a craniosacral therapy session, we're not only working with the tissues, but we're also allowing the wisdom of the wider fields of function to support the health of the horse. And it's this interchange between the wider fields and the physical body that allows for so much depth and understanding of the horse during a craniosacral therapy session. It makes it a very unique therapy because we can support the horse's health without manipulation. So we were always working with the horse and not just doing something to the horse. So let's look at those, those fields of function. Okay, so here we have the tissue field. So that's the physical field of the horse. Um, we can very much work there, tune into that and listen to fluid motion and bone motility. And then we have the fluid field or the fluid body. And that's the biosphere, the area directly around the horse. And the fluid body really supports the tissue body. And then we have the tidal field or the tidal body, which is the widest field of function. And it's kind of the field of nature and beyond. It really goes out to the horizon. So when we're working with horses, we have these three dimensions to work within. And my sense is that horses are naturally extremely aware of these fields of function. And they actually need the connection to them in order to be in true health. In a cranial session with them, we should hold them with this awareness to those wider fields as we work. That's really important. And when I'm asked to treat a horse for the first time and I make a hands-on connection with them, I like to assess how much a horse is functioning in relationship to those wider fields. Actually, it's a great initial diagnostic skill because if the system is open and available, then the likelihood is there's a lot of health present and change can occur more readily on a tissue level if something presents there. However, if I tune into a horse and it feels tight and held with a lack of fluid movement in their system, and I really can't sense a good connection to the wider fields, that's when our therapeutic skills can be of great benefit. Because by holding a neutral, open stillness for the horse and expanding our awareness out, it invites their system to drop back into that natural reconnection to the wider fields. And this is crucial for their health and well-being. And it feels really good to them. They innately know it's their most natural state. So as we listen to the fluid motion expressing as primary respiration within the horse's system, we're also observing the different rhythms and rates of that movement. And we name these the tides. And one of the things that I observe in my work cranially with them is that the most natural and clear tide for horses that expresses most through their system is long tide. So that has a hundred second cycles, so 50 seconds in inhalation and 50 seconds in exhalation. And I always think of long tide as the tide of nature and the wider world. And as humans, when we spend time with our horses and our, con our connection to nature kind of naturally increases, because we're connected to long tide as well, we'll drop into that with them, and this can make it very healing for us too. In fact, there is a lovely saying that there is nothing better for the inside of a person than the outside of a horse. And actually one of the things that's been really fascinating to me uh, more recently in my work with horses is that I'm occasionally able to perceive an even lower, slower tide. Um, present within their systems. And I actually name this as horse tide. Um, I've noticed that it has about 180 second cycles. So that's about 90 seconds in inhalation and 90 seconds in exhalation. It's extremely slow and, and it's required me to get very, very deeply settled in order to perceive it. And I've only ever actually perceived it in a horse even though I think it's probably available um, in, in other animals, um, in the animal kingdom, and certainly in the much of the kind of natural world, I would say. So when I'm working 
in long tide with horses, I feel this strong universal connection to the wider fields, but I'm also noticing particulars within the tissues. So I have an awareness to the whole, but I can also recognize specifics. And I think that's an, very important. And it's, it's a skill that we really have as craniosacral therapists, which is what makes our work so unique. And it's important if we're going to work with horses that we understand some of their basic instincts. So their central nervous system is very finely tuned. A horse's brain has a very small frontal lobe. So that's the part of the brain that deals with strategies, um, rationalizing, making plans, and that's not really so available for horses. Instead, their brain allocates a lot of space to perception, fear, rapid movement, and associated learning. So a horse will forgive, but it will never forget. And as a prey animal, one of the things that's helped them really to survive as a species for thousands of years is their depth of perception and the fact that they're a flight animal. So their perception allows them to notice the subtle shifts in energy of a predator in the distance. And this is key to their existence. So I'm just going to show you a slide here. So here we have a zebra, a horse, drinking from a waterhole quite happily next to a lion. Now in this moment, that lion will have no sense in its system, no activation towards its desire to hunt. The moment that changed, the moment anything shifted in that lion's physiology, this zebra would be long gone. And it would be able to perceive that shift in energy from really quite far away. So if that energy were to shift, we would end up with this sort of scenario. So the horse is now in flight, the zebra is now in flight, and the energy of that uh, lion is much more active. And I think as horse owners, we can relate to that. We know that we can be riding our horse along quite happily along a road and suddenly the horse will jump sideways and spook or maybe run forward. And we'll look and we, we haven't seen anything. We haven't been able to perceive anything, but there will have been some energetic thing that has caused that horse to do that. And it has perceived it very subtly. And that mechanism still really exists in horses today. They rely on their ability to flee from a dangerous situation, whether that's um, a real danger or a perceived danger. But however, this is where the difficulty can arise. If a horse can't access that flight response um, when it needs to, because maybe it's in a stable or maybe it's tied up or maybe the person riding it is really holding it back, then its central nervous system can become overwhelmed by the trauma. And even in an extreme case, it can go beyond overwhelm into a state of freeze and dissociation. And even after the original threat has passed, the horse's nervous system may remain stuck in that freeze state. The result being that the nervous system is no longer functioning and self-regulating between activation and relaxation, between sympathetic and parasympathetic. And the horse becomes, to a greater or lesser degree, what I call functionally frozen. So you could still ride the horse. The horse might, from the outside, look perfectly normal. But there will be a compromise to its overall health. Um, and in the long run, this can have effects on their behavior, their performance, and their health, both locally or systemically. Now, hopefully, that horse goes out into a field with other horses, and through social engagement, its nervous system begins to downregulate and the horse comes out of its functionally frozen state. However, if it doesn't have access to interaction with other horses, for example, it's in a stable or it's in a field on its own without the ability to groom with other horses and touch other horses, then its nervous system will remain frozen, um, leaving them either much more reactive and highly strong or really dissociated and shut down. And this trauma to the nervous system can occur as early as when a horse is weaned. Sometimes its weaning process will happen really quickly and unsympathetically, which can, in my experience, have a long-term effect on the nervous system. Because the correct pathways aren't laid down and the autonomic uh, regulation process becomes disrupted. So they then continue to develop and grow with the trauma experience slightly hijacking their nervous system 
And this can have a great effect on their attachment patterns to other horses and with humans. And I see this a lot in practice, and it's something that we can really work with to resolve through craniosacral therapy. Actually, there's also research to show that horses that are weaned early are likely to develop stomach ulcers and digestive issues later in life. And, and it's interesting because a lot of owners don't really know how their horse was weaned. A lot of the time a horse will come to them later on in its life and they don't really know about something that can have been so significant for the horse. Um, and in a craniosacral session, I can often get a sense of how traumatic that has been for a horse, uh, particularly when I'm working with a, an awareness of their nervous system that will often come up and kind of play out. And that's great because then it can move through and they can come out of that frozen state if there's any of that left still in their system. So when a horse settles into a craniosacral session and we establish a safe field of listening for the whole horse, that unmet trauma in the system will begin to dissipate because we're listening from a place of total neutrality and stillness. And it's common to see that dissipation take place through a bit of shaking, some twitching, often a lot of yawning, and over time there will be a rebalancing of their nervous system. Um, an example of this is I was working recently with a mare and her owner had contacted me because um, she was really anxious. Um, she had terrible separation anxiety. She wouldn't stand still when her owner got on. She would never ride out without other horses around. And it was limiting what the owner could do with her. So we did a lot of settling with this mare. I would often invite a deep systemic settling to her system. And she would drop into the still points for a significant amount of time at the session. And I mostly worked from her sacrum. She actually was quite sensitive around her head. That improved with the sessions. But at first, it would have been just too much for her to work around her head. So I would do a lot of work from her sacrum. And she really changed. Over about six to eight sessions, she started to become more relaxed. The first thing that happened was she was really able to stand still when her owner got on. Um, and then her confidence just grew amazingly. She would be happy to be ridden out on her own. Um, she would lead the ride when there were other horses. She was much less spooky. And what was really lovely was to see the relationship with her owner really develop. They became much closer because um, they, they felt safer with each other. So when we listen cranially to horses, one of the most valuable skills we can use is our practitioner neutral and our ability to access a deep tranquility within our own system. This creates the conditions to establish a really safe sense of safety for the horse. And this is helped by the fact that we're not actually being mechanical or we're not transferring any desire to fix or change anything. We're just inviting a stillness that helps the tensions in their body to um, heal and re so the body is rebalancing itself and coming back to its own most natural state of health and amongst other things owners will typically tell me that their horses are less reactive are generally calmer after a cranial session and vices start to drop away and the horse just feels people will say to me oh she just feels more whole he just feels more whole and generally more settled an example of one of my equine clients who benefits from regular cranial sessions is a lovely horse called Perry. And um, his owner, Lindsay, has kindly given me permission to share his story with you and to show you some pictures of him this evening. So um, Perry had had a nasty accident when I met him. He had been um, backing out of a horse box, which is the normal way for a horse to be unloaded out of a horse box but he had slipped and fallen over backwards and actually knocked himself completely out, which is very unusual for a horse. Obviously the vet came and the vet uh, treated him over the next few weeks, he improved, and then he was seen by an equine physio. And it was actually the equine physio that recommended that he have some craniosacral therapy sessions. She was finding that he was quite tight in his body and um, she reckoned that you know, he had some unresolved trauma in his system. So when I first went to work with Perry, um, his system was quite quiet. He definitely was still fairly shut down. He didn't have access to those wider fields of function. I just felt like that wasn't really available for him. 
So we did a few sessions. And a few sessions in, um, I'll just share my screen with you again. He laid down. You can see here, I have a um, hand hold on his frontal bone. And I also had another hand on his cervical spine. And he really started to settle deeply into the session. Um, as the session progressed, he went incredibly deep. So he laid flat out. Um, he started to do some groaning, some snoring. Um, he was doing some twitching. His breathing was changing. It would go quite fast and then it would go quite slow. Um, but what was interesting was at no point was he distressed about this. He was just, he just seemed to just be happy to be very deeply in the stillness and let um, any trauma that was in his system just resolve naturally and dissipate. I'm actually just holding his hoof by this point. Um, luckily, he has a wonderful open owner who um, completely understands cranial and was able just to trust in the process. So he was probably like this for the best part of kind of half an hour. And then um, he sat up and as you can see, he's nice and grateful for the session. Um, and I was just uh, continuing to make a light contact there with his head, but I could immediately feel that he was back in connection to the wider fields of function, that there was just more health present in his system. Um, after this, probably about 15 minutes later, he got up, he was just eating his hay and he was perfectly fine, perfectly happy. Um, what was interesting was that the equine physio said to me that when she next went to treat him, he just felt much softer in his whole body. And I treat Perry regularly. Um, he still lies down in most of his sessions. Um, he still really trusts the cranial work. We have a, a lovely relationship now um, and he's a, a great horse. It's going to stop. So there are many areas of the horse's physiology that can benefit from cranial work. And when we work as I do through the biodynamic model, we are working with the whole horse and what shows up as a priority of treatment within their system. So every horse is different, so we need to work at their pace with unconditional regard for who they are and with the deepest respect for the different patterns of experience expressing in their physiology, depending on their past and current life and numerous other factors, including environment, training, and really whether they're being truly understood as an individual or not. And this can be met very deeply in a cranial session. I think um, it's important to mention the significance of working craniosacrally with the horse um, and their heart field. So the, that would be the electromagnetic field around the horse's heart. And I'm just going to um, share my screen with you again. So here we have an image of um, a horse's heart field. So if we look here is a human and here is the human's heart field. But the horse's heart field is absolutely enormous. It's five times more powerful than our heart field. It extends up to nine meters wide. And actually for me, it's one of the reasons why people and horses can connect so deeply on an emotional level. And when we work cranially with a horse and we slow right down, they really respond well to this and they deeply settle as our heart fields sync up. That's um, certainly the work of the Heart Math Institute our hearts will sync up with the animals around us. And I can really feel this expanse of a horse's heart field. And as a practitioner, for me, it's kind of when a session is going to get very interesting, because often I get a strong sense of what a horse is holding emotionally. And this can be really powerful. I mean, and it, it feels enormous. The expanse feels enormous. I often have to kind of really ground myself and use my earth fulcrum when I'm in that heart space and when that's opening up because it just becomes so wide. And what's more interesting it, more recently in this space is I've actually been able to begin to perceive not just through my hands as I would normally do in a cranial session, but also through what I can only describe as a kind of knowing consciousness. And by this, I mean um, that I know something about what has happened to the horse or something that it's finding difficult. And this is fascinating to me that um, they connect with us so emotionally that this is something I can begin to perceive. 
And I'm finding it a very useful therapeutic skill that I'm actually still developing. But the level of trust that can be established in a cranial, se cranial sickle therapy session between um, a human and a horse is significant. And I never underestimate the importance of that. It always feels like a great privilege to be working with them on such a deep level of their being. And because of the intensity of their sensitivity, they can really feel projections and transference of emotions from humans. And they, and they feel that very deeply. They can definitely feel our joy, our sadness, our anxiety, and our wants as a human. Um, for example, our desire to win. You know, winning on a material level, winning prizes really means very little to a horse. But they can feel the pressure of that. And that's something that they often don't really understand. So when we're working with them, we must meet them where they are and let those kind of organizing fields settle so that it can be real shifts between the heart fields of humans and horses. And I really see that. I see in practice, um, people connect deeper uh, with their horses um, when we work with them. I mostly, most often I ask for an owner to be present in the stable with the horse because I think it's important that we share that space together and that we can all drop together. And um, sometimes owners find it um, intriguing that their horses will go so still and, and so quiet. Um, and they'll often feel that themselves in their own bodies, which I think is, is really healing and can really enhance their relationship. So, and here is a picture of me um, using the handhold that I do in order to make a contact with the horse's heart field. So this is Reggie, he's my horse. Um, and another thing that they often do when we connect their heart is they will, with their heart space, they will really look, turn around and look at you. It, it's this kind of very intense look of, and I always feel like we're looking really deeply into each other. And it's almost like they give you a look of sort of like, how do you know? How do you know this stuff? Um, and it's always a very special moment in the treatment. So, of course, when we're working with issues that present in a horse, uh, we can work on a very physical level as well. So let's look at some basic equine anatomy. So here we have a horse's skull. It's um, made up of 34 bones and it accounts for about 10% of their body weight. And its main function is to protect the brain, the inner ear, the eyes, and the nasal passages. And it's made up of flat bones that come together at sutures. And depending on the horse's development as it grows, we can work with the patterns of experience that sometimes are held within the bones themselves and at the sutures. Something interesting that I often notice when I'm working at a horse's cranium are its birth patterns. So a horse will come out in the diving position with its head between its front legs. And often cranially, I kind of get a sense of the head elongating and moving forward. So their birth patterns will play out much as a human's will as well. I think it's interesting that you can't actually palpate a horse's sphenoid from the outside of their head. Um, so in order to make a contact of the sphenoid, so if you wanted to notice any um, physiological or non-physiological patterns of the sphenoid, which can be really present in a horse, you would have to make a contact um, up through their mouth, which of course isn't practical. So a lot of the time I will actually make a contact at their muscle just here, and I can really get a sense through energetically into the sphenoid, and they will really drop their head into, into your hand at that point. Um, I also initially will look at the asymmetry of a horse's cranial, but I really feel that like I get the full picture when I use my palpation skills to feel the kind of natural motion of the bones and whether it's expressing well, whether there are any held tensions that we can invite to resolve. A place that's really interesting to work cranially is an area called the pole. It's, it's the OA junction. So the true pole in a horse is the occipital protuberance, just here. Um, it actually sits between the horse's ears, but most people consider the pole as C1 and C2 as well. And horses can really um, hold a lot of tension here. So a horse's head collar will sit, the strap of the head collar will, will sit across here. A bridle also sits there. So there's often a lot of pressure into the pole and that can 
create an imbalance throughout actually the whole of their physiology. Um, it can create difficulties for the horse flexing its head, it can create ear sensitivity and definitely behavioural problems. And something that really affects the pole that's actually quite common for horses is something called a pullback. So when a horse is tied up and it gets a fright, its uh, flight instinct kicks in and it, it goes to run and it will pull back so fast that it will break the line that it's tied up with from its head collar. And that causes extreme pressure into the pole. It often causes hypotonosity, so extreme muscle tension, and I think it causes them a really bad headache. And it's interesting that um, headaches kind of slightly get overlooked in horses. Oftentimes people are looking at the rest of the physiology, but they're not thinking necessarily about the cranium and what's going on in there. And I think these pullbacks also really disrupt the fascia around the pole. So when I'm working, I'm often inviting space and disengagement of these compressive forces within the cranium. And so I can feel kind of that moment of pullback and the forces within that. And we allow the bones and the tissues to reorganize and to function back to true health. I think another really important uh, thing to mention in a horse's anatomy is the nuchal ligament. So it attaches here at the pole and it runs all the way down the top line of the horse. When we get to the withers, it becomes the supraspinous ligament and it runs all the way to the sacrum. So there's a connection from the sacrum right up to the pole. And when I make an initial contact with a horse, when I'm working cranially, I often start at the sacrum. And one of the things I'm looking to feel is, you know, can I feel that connection all the way up the nuchal ligament to the pole? Does that horse feel like one whole horse? Um, if they do, invariably they've got quite a nice level of health in their system. But sometimes, it, quite often it can feel sort of like two horses stuck together. And then I'm looking to help that horse to come back to feeling more whole again and that connection through the nuchal ligament. Um, so here is a horse's brain. You can see here, this is the tiny amount of frontal lobe that they actually have. But I wanted to show you this slide because I think again, we can get a sense of when we have bridles and head collars, how close they are actually sitting to the brain and the brainstem and all the cranial nerves that facilitate the face and the neck. And of course, the vagus nerve, which is a key nerve um, when we're looking at uh, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So the TMJ, the temporomandibular joint, this is key in horses. A lot of horses will hold a lot of tension here. So their bit goes in here, and some horses will really clench their mouth when they're being ridden, and that can create an awful lot of holding and tension here. And it can affect their ability to chew, and it can affect um, their balance, the function of their neck and their back, and how they behave. So when I'm working cranially, I'll often have uh, one hand this side and one hand this side, and just offer that invitation of space, um, which can be really therapeutic for a horse. They'll often really do a lot of yawning at that point, a lot of releasing, really extending their tongue right out. Um, the other thing I notice often when I'm working at the TMJ is a kind of imprinting of um, a dental procedure that a horse might have. So horses, um, domestic horses will have their teeth rasp by the vet or an equine dentist and that's because they won't be eating a diet that a wild horse would where it would naturally wear down the surface of the side surface of the teeth. So it needs to be rasped in order to stop um, soreness to the gum and the cheek to the cheekbone. And so this rasping is something that I often feel, I can feel the kind of vibration within the TMJ and it's really nice to, to give the horse space and to really settle so that, that the, those sort of forces that have come in to their um, teeth and, and their whole jaw can really dissipate and let go. Bridles can um, create quite a lot of pressure for a horse. So there there's can be external pressure from the straps here and an internal pressure from the bit and a lot of pressure around the TMJ. Um, kind of historically, 
bridles haven't been considered very much. There's been a lot of work about saddles and getting saddles to be comfortable for a horse. And it's only recently that bridles like the quantum bridle, which is a lot more spacious and gives a lot more freedom around the TMJ and for the cranial nerves that are coming on board. And, and for me, it's great to see. I really noticed the difference when I work cranially with a horse that um, isn't ridden and, and doesn't wear a bridle compared to the cranium of a horse that does. And that's particularly true in competition horses. There can be a lot of pressure on their, on their cranium. So, you know, regular cranial can be really key for them to help for the whole of their physiology. I really believe that if the bones of the cranium can move freely, then everything else um, in their body can work in better health too. And a bone that I'm really interested in when I work is this, is the hyoid bone. So this is the hyoid apparatus. It's actually a, a horseshoe shaped bone and it actually sits here and it attaches to the temporal bone, to the pharynx and to the tongue. And so it's very significant because obviously the bit sits there on the tongue and the hyoids can be really affected. Um, it has a lot of mu muscular attachments up here to the pole, which of course then attaches down to the nuchal, through the nuchal ligament. So we can often really feel um, the tension there throughout the whole of the body. And, it, and when I make a contact with the hyoid, hyoid, I'll just bring my hand in just under the horse's throat and really listen. Um, sometimes I'll notice, um, in fact, recently I worked with a horse that had a few breathing issues and actually the left side of its hyoid just felt really kind of drawn up and tight. Um, and as we worked over a number of sessions that really seemed to settle back down and the horse's breathing actually got a bit better and I noticed that his diaphragm actually started to function a bit better as well because his breathing was easier. So pressure on a horse's skull can deeply affect the position and motions of the bones and have an enormous effect on the whole system and their balance. Um, Cranially, when I'm feeling these areas of compression, I'll offer a deep settling and the forces holding these patterns will naturally find a state of balance and therefore reorganize back to health. And in my experience, horses really enjoy a cranial session. Uh, so this is an equine client of mine called Ron. He belongs to an equine physio, Kate Haynes. And uh, Ron is a lovely horse. He really enjoys his cranial sessions. Um, I'm really able to connect very deeply through the heart field with him. And really recently he's really um, dissipated a lot of emotional um, experiences um, through some past history that he has. I'm actually making a contact here at his cervical spine, but you can see his eye is really soft, his ears are nice and relaxed. And he's actually really dropping into my shoulder there, really offering the weight of, of his head into my shoulder as he settles. And it's really good for them to deepen into a session and this trust that we're holding between them is really important. They inherently know that this work is good for them and we just have to take the time um, to build the trust and hold the stillness so that they can really benefit from a session. So I'd like to now just uh, run a little demo video that I've made. So this is very much a demonstration video. It's not a, a full cranial session in any way. Um, it's just to give you an idea of some of the handholds um, that I use when I'm working cranially. Um, so this is Reggie. He's my horse. He's actually a rescue horse. He's an ex race horse. Um, he was racing as a two year old. So he would have been out running really before his joints were fully developed. So there would have been a lot of early strain on his, on his joints. Um, we actually don't ride him because he has a problem with his suspensory ligaments, again, probably from doing too much too young um, before he was fully developed. Um, but he's an absolute gentle giant. Um, he's wonderful on our postgrad trainings because he's, um, he loves cranial work um, and he's really happy to have cranial at any point. Um, so I will run the video and I may stop and start it and also just um, talk over it a little bit. So as I explained, I'm working here at the crane at the sacrum, making a contact there. And I just would like you just to notice his face, notice how he's beginning to really settle into the treatment. 
I'm obviously holding Reggie myself, but often I'll have an owner holding the horse or I'll have the horse ideally without any head collar on because I really want to see the feedback. So I'm just going to stop that there. So here I made a contact with his psoas muscle just here. And I know that for Reggie, that's a kind of difficult area. It's somewhere that he, he often gets quite tight and quite held in. So as you can see, he goes to move away, but then you'll notice that he's actually okay and he's able to kind of stay, stay with the process. So he comes back then to looking settled, nice and settled again. And I'm holding a really nice wide field of listening here. Sometimes people ask me um, when I'm working, doesn't it hurt your arms to have your arms in the air when you're working cranially like that? And I actually find that I really get used to it. Um, I, I'm so noticing what's going on in the horse's physiology as well as holding the wider field that I don't actually notice it. It's not a problem at all. So he's really deeply settled into this session. Just enjoying the stillness. So here I'm making a contact with his lumbosacral region. But I just really want you to notice him licking and chewing. So that is how a horse will process something. That's some feedback. So they'll lick and chew. You can see he's settling. Settling back in. But that will be quite frequent throughout a session. They will just stop and lick and chew and then go back to feeling still and settled. So here I'm making a contact at the lumbosacral region and also the SI joints, which can be really crucial to work out. They get a lot of tension, they can get really tight. So we can really offer some space there. Making a contact there with his ilium. And I know that for Reggie, his pelvis is an area that gets tight, so it is beneficial for him to do quite a lot of work there. So, so even there, there are a few flies that day. It was quite a hot day, but he can drop back into the stillness. So here, I'm uh, back making contact with that heart field, that heart space, but I'm also in the diaphragm, and I actually think that's a really nice hold for a horse. It gives them a nice sense of security um, and it's not too intense then on the heart field because we really, really do want to give that space a lot, a lot of space. And how he's responding is really very typical of how a horse will respond during a craniosacral session. So he gets a little distracted by his field mates who are just over the fence. But as long as I stay consistent and hold that nice stillness, he'll come back, drop back into the stillness. And all the time, the system is coming back into health. So here I'm making contact with the frontal bone. And because this is a demo video, I'm moving a lot faster than I ever would in a true cranial session. I'd spend a lot longer in each handhold, but for the pur purposes of this video, I wanted to show you 
some handholds. So here I've got a contact with his frontal bone and his pole. And um, I quite like this hold um, for working at the pole because I can really offer some space and disengagement between those two bones. Um, and that can be really therapeutic for the, for the whole cranium. I can also make a contact with the nasal bone. And here it starts to dissipate. This is very typical. So although I'm, this is towards the end of the session, I'm working with his cervical spine. He's doing a lot of yawning, a lot of releasing. This is very common. This is exactly how horses will release in this session. So I've got a nice light touch not being invasive in any way. And he's really able to release. Okay. So a um, couple of sort of practical elements of working with horses. If you want to work cranially um, with horses, you have to graduate from um, a practitioner, a human practitioner foundation training first. Um, and then you can undertake a postgrad equine training. I run my training with Penel Meredith, um, and you need to run, you need to um, have done the postgrad course in order to get insurance to work with horses. Um, and obviously we go into much more depth in the in the cranial, in the, in the postgrad training than I've had time to do this evening. We have sadly had to move our training this year. Um, we've had to postpone it to next year. So we run it twice a year. We run it in May and September. So May next year is full, but we do have some spaces in September. And I'm also aware of a couple of other um, cranial training, biodynamic equine cranial training. Sarah Jane Saul is running one and she's a great practitioner. And there are also some international um, biodynamic trainings um, around. So if you're interested in that, do be in touch with me via email. Um, I really need to stress that vets must be primary healthcare providers for horses. And as craniosacrotherapists, we must get vets permission when we're going to work with a horse. We are complementary to vet work. Um, but I think it's important to um, gain a good relationship with your equine vet and also your equine physio. I think that's very important. So it feels like a, a really great purpose of mine to work um, with horses and to make the work more available for horses and to increase the awareness of biodynamic craniosacral therapy as a great treatment and option for horse owners to consider. Um, at this time, I feel like I kind of know more about horses than I ever have done before. And I would really like to take that forward to benefit them. They've given me so much in my life that I feel I must return the favor. And I really think that a, a schedule um, of, of craniosacral therapy treatments should be just part of their regular treatments. So I hope this evening has given you a, a flavour of um, equine biodynamics. And um, I don't know if there are any questions, Tracy. I don't know if uh, anybody has anything that they'd like to ask now. We can go into some questions. Uh, yes, we have quite a few questions coming up. Um, okay, I'll do my best to answer them. I'll just go. A um, lot of people asking, how long does your CST sessions with horses last? How long is it? Okay. I mean, I, I try to be quite open around that because every horse is different. Um, I mean, some horses really need a lot of time just to settle. Um, we need kind of the feel to settle. So I will be close to that horse and I really want that horse to realize that I'm not going to do anything to it that I'm just there with it so I will take that time to kind of connect the wider fields and get a sense of the horse within that before I've even put any hands on um, and usually in a first session um, you know that can take a bit of time that can take sort of 15 20 minutes I consider it a bit like the time it would take for um, a human to drop into the holistic shift. Um, so it's really important that we just hold that stillness and allow the field to settle, particularly if the owner is in the stable as well. Um, and then I would say it's usually about an hour. I find that um, anything longer than that, it can be a bit much. Um, you know, 
but I tend to play it by ear. If after about 20 minutes, I feel that that's enough. And I kind of know, I get this sense from, from a horse. I was talking about that kind of knowing consciousness that I'm using more and more in my practice. I just kind of like, you know, are we done here? And often it'll be like, yes. Or um, a horse will just, just walk away. Um, as I was mentioning, I quite like to treat horses without any head collars on in a stable or in a field so that I can really get the honest feedback so they're not just being held um, and being kind of, kind of made to be good. I want to really see what's really going on for them. So, um, you know, and sometimes after about half an hour, 45 minutes, they're just kind of, yeah, I'm done. That's enough for today. And I will really trust that. I will never push that. I'll never kind of um, go beyond what's right for them and their system. Great, thanks, Edwina. Um, question here, which is, can, can tie in two questions together, really. Bridget would like to know, could your horse be upset because the problem is with the owner? And what do you do if you sense that? And Al was also asking, do you ever refuse to work with an owner who's causing the problem? Oh, that, they're great questions and it's a very interesting one and it can be a very interesting dynamic. And for sure, there are definitely some horses and owners that just don't connect. And, um, you know, that can be quite difficult sometimes in practice because, um, you know, I'll really feel a sense that the issue is not with horses. Actually, what is happening is the horse is picking up um on something that's a problem in the owner's system and it's really affecting the horse because they're so sensitive and i usually try and find a way to be diplomatic and mention that um recently um that i've noticed it as i say through the more, um knowing consciousness i can pick up on something on the owner it happened to me just recently i was um working with a horse and the owner was in the stable and i could really tell that the owner had a problem with her back um, and that was affecting the horse. And so I just asked her, I said, her, do you have a problem with your back? And she said, yeah, I do. And I said, you know, I really advise you to go and get some treatment around that because actually he's feeling that tension and he's feeling that pressure and that's um, really hard for him. And um, most owners in my experience will do everything they can to support their horse's well-being, um, and they'll often actually forget about themselves or not invest in themselves in the same way and so I really encourage owners to do that as well because it's all part of the whole and um, I think people overlook that sometimes. Um, I can't think of a time when I have ever refused to uh, work with a the horse. There's certainly stuff I see that I find quite upsetting and actually these days you'll rarely find me at a, a horse competition or something like that because um, you know when you understand horses on such a deep level of their being some of the stuff that you see go on can feel a little bit ugly um, and upsetting um, so I haven't had an experience where I've refused to work for a horse refused to work um, with a with a particular horse and an owner um, I think I'd probably have a big discussion around that first and, and see what was going on and see you know if there was any way that I could somehow support that horse to just be heard and met um, a little more easily. Thanks Edwina. Um, just putting another few questions that are similar together here as well. Sure. Um, is there anything you can recommend for people with very little experience of horses? This has been asked a few times. Can I do yeah. it if I don't have any experience of horses? Yeah. Is it some kind of handicap for us? And also, okay. do you need much physical strength? Okay. Um, so I think anybody can learn to work with horses. I think the key is to get familiar with horses. So spend, you know, see if you can find a way to spend time around horses, just getting to know them, because it's really important that we, when we work biodynamically with horses, that we feel really relaxed in our system, because otherwise they will notice that, and on some level they're not really gonna drop into the depth of the session that we'd really like to work at. Um, so I think you need to get kind of comfortable and confident around horses. And the only way I can recommend that is to try and just find a way of hanging out with them a bit um, and just spending a bit of time getting to know them. I mean, you, you know, there are lots of resources online around, you know, watching um, how horses, you know, horse psychology and how horses interact with each other and, and things like that. But I, I think, yeah, try and um, spend time just with horses, try and see if you can access that in some way through riding stables or through friends, maybe asking around, seeing if somebody has a horse that you could just go and spend some time with and really notice how you feel in your own body when you're around a horse. Because, you know, it's lovely to work with them, but some people get near a horse and just 
whoa, you know, that there's so much horse. Wow. Um, you know, that's a lot to hold. And so, you know, you really need to just work on getting comfortable around them. Um, and just remind me what the second part of that question was, Tracy. Yeah, do you have to be physically strong yourself? You have to be physically strong, thank you. Um, I think you have to keep yourself reasonably fit. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't consider myself a particularly physically strong person. Certainly to work cranially, you don't have to be physically strong because the touch is very light. Um, you actually need to retain a, a real lightness and um, sensitivity to your system. And that doesn't, that's different from physical strength. Um, but, you know, like anything, I think it's good to, to remain um, physically healthy and well, but I don't think strength necessarily comes into it because our cranial skills don't require an actual physical strength. Thank you. Um, question here from Sheila. When working with children, she likes to have the family present. So her question is, are you working simultaneously with horse and owner in the same way that we work with child and family? Yeah, it's a great question. And actually, it's very true. Yeah, I am very much. I think it's actually working with horses is actually very similar to working with children and babies. Um, you're holding a lot. You're holding the owner and the horse. And I think it's really important um, for them to be in that triad. Um, I think, you know, you can gain a lot and you can learn a lot about the horse um, because like, as I mentioned before, you can often pick up on what they're picking up on from the owner. And then, you know, sometimes an owner has a very, very activated nervous system. People oftentimes will um, come to their horses with all their emotion at the end of the day when they're really tired and they've got a lot of stuff and everything. And horses don't really un understand that. They, they will um, feel the emotion and they'll get a sense of it. But it's really hard for them and sometimes it just really activates their nervous system as well and so um, sometimes yeah we can just offer some settling um, for the owner as well before we even begin to work with the horse. Um, I find that oftentimes that happens quite naturally you know, as, as the field begins to settle sometimes owners will say to me things like oh you know I just feel oh, I feel really tired or you know gosh isn't it quiet in the yard today and things like that and they are indications to me that they are settling as well and that really supports the horse. A um, question here from Mina can you use a chair or something similar to work on a big horse if you're short? Yeah I don't like doing that because you know horses can move suddenly um, and you know I just think gosh I don't want to suddenly make any sudden dramatic movements around horses so I don't really recommend standing on a chair um, I would more recommend that you make uh, a contact a handhold with the horse where you feel comfortable and then really work on working energetically through their system until you get more used to um, working you know if you're working with a big horse and you're quite little yourself until you get used to working more with your hands a bit more above your head um, what I have found when you're working with horses' heads is as you work, they will often drop their head and drop their head and drop your head until your hands actually don't have to be that high. They're, they're quite low. But I don't recommend standing on a box because I just think if they move suddenly, you know, that's a potential accident and, and you know, safety is, is always paramount. So a question here from Sarah. Do you talk to the horse while treating? Is there any kind of verbal connection? Um, I don't feel I need any verbal connection. I mean, I think when I go in for the first time, I'll, I'll kind of say hello and I often let them sniff the back of my hand um, and I'll, you know, stroke them all over. I feel like I'm immediately beginning to connect um, through the wider field. So actually, I don't find that I need the verbal connection um, and I need that. Sometimes I will use it to reassure if, if a horse um, is starting to dissipate some trauma, I'll, I'll sometimes say you're doing really well. You're doing really well here. And they'll often turn, they will often turn and kind of just look at you. And then I'll offer the back of my hand as a sort of reassurance. But I don't feel like so much that I need, um, need the verbal communication. I, I get a sense of it. Um, sometimes I know something and then yes, I'll verbally communicate that to the owner. But I feel like I'm meeting the horse um, in a very non-verbal plane. Um, so that doesn't feel like something I, I really need to do. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, Danny would like to know, do you work with the hyoid both sides at the same time? Um, yeah, I do, actually. I tend to make a, a contact here. This is kind of, you know, how I'll do it. Um, and, and I do listen both sides. I can 
clearly differentiate um, between both sides. So um, I find that easy. We have had students in the past who found that just a little bit too difficult to differentiate. So then you can work from one side or the other, but I personally tend to hold the whole hyoid and get a sense of the whole function and the motility of the bone. I think you've already named this actually, Edwina, but perhaps just to name it again. Um, are we able to work on animals and horses without having to get the vet's permission or does that still apply? I think it, it does still apply. Sometimes um, what I find happens is I'll mention that and, and owners just want to take responsibility for their horses. Um, so they don't um, necessarily do it, um, but we have to recommend it. Great, thanks. Um, Bridie would like to know, have you ever found a horse that does not respond or like craniosacral? Um, what I have found is highly activated horses. So horses that find it hard to drop into a cranial session. And that usually for me is an indicator of something else going on. You know, some other, something that's holding their nervous system that um, really isn't allowing them to drop into that cranial space. Because if I, as a practitioner, am really embodying that stillness and that connection to those wider fields, which is a horse's most natural state, they will, they want to drop back into that. If they can't, I'm like, okay, what, you know, then I'm going to start listening to their nervous system. You know, what's going on in their nervous system? Why is there some holding? And again, you know, I won't be intense about it. If they can't, if they can't do that, we'll step back a bit. I'll take my hands off. I'll just hold the space around them until they settle. It's, you know, and sometimes some horses systems are quite guarded. Um, they can be a bit kind of like, you know, I'll put my hands on and, and they'll be able to kind of like, I want to show you, oh no, I don't, that's too much. I want to show you. And I'm just kind of meeting the edges of that all the time and just holding that. Um, and sometimes, you know, they'll then yawn a little bit and then they'll go back into a guarded state. So then I'll drop back. And so, you know, this kind of interchange all the time and this interplay that you've got to be really aware of all the time. Um, but I don't think I have any horses who, um, you know, don't respond in some way during a cranial session. You know, it may be short. They may not drop into a really deep stillness for a whole hour or deep as deeply as you saw Reggie do. do. But um, most of them will show something, will, will, will be able to let you in for a little bit. But that can take a number of sessions, you know, much like humans. Sometimes we don't get the get really to feel their, their system and for them to be able to drop into the holistic shift until there's been a number of sessions. But for me, that's an indicator of what's really being held in their nervous system. Um, just on the back of that, there's a question here. Do you find holistic shift is perceptible in the settling with a horse? Yeah. yeah, I definitely do. I mean, um, yeah, I definitely do. There's definitely a point where I get um, a sense of a systemic settling within the whole system. And that's really what I'm holding to start with is the possibility of that, um, because that really is the start of the session for me. Um, question from Kathy here. Can that unmet weaning trauma be released on a horse that is 23 years old? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, and actually sometimes that makes me really sad. I get a really sense of sadness when I'm walk working with an older horse and I really, you know, feel that weaning process starting to dissipate. And I'm like, wow, you have held this your whole life. You have gotten on with, with all your life and probably been, you know, fantastic and, and, and got, and given a lot of people a lot of pleasure and yet you've still been holding that. And so, um, yeah, I absolutely believe that if it's had that bigger imprint and, and it's slightly hijacked their system for that long, they will hold that until somebody listens on the right level for that to dissipate, whether they're, you know, a year old or 23 year olds. For me, there's just a kind of sadness that I have to really own as my own sadness um, and not project onto them because often that, you know, horses, um, you know, some horses have really been okay with it, but it's just then, you know, we offer the, the facilities and the kind of, um, um, the state where they can uh, let that trauma from that weaning dissipate. And sometimes it's not upsetting, but I get a sense of like, wow, you, you've done all your whole life and you've been holding that. Um, and that's why, you know, I really hope that when people next pass a horse in the field, uh, they won't just disregard it. They might just look over and really consider what that horse might be holding inside and yet still really getting on with um, providing a lot of pleasure for a lot of people. 
Um, got a question from a horse owner with no therapeutic training. Um, this is from Kelly, and she'd like mm -hmm. to know um, the holds that you demonstrated. Would it be okay to make connections with a horse who is fearful and anxious? As a horse owner, would you would you recommend holding in those places? Um, I think it, it's hard to hold cranially if you don't have a cranial training because you can't drop into the the kind of level that we're working at cranially. You've got to really drop into the stillness and widen out. And those skills are quite hard to do if you haven't been through a practitioner training. You know, it can take you know quite a while to get skillful at that. Um, I would say, you know, just some light touch if, if you're not cranially trained, you know, don't just always be brushing your horses really hard, really notice how much they like the light touch, maybe rest your hand gently on their sacrum and just kind of feel a stillness in your body, try not to have any thoughts, try to clear your mind of thoughts and just and just to be close to your horse like that. So I certainly have some friends who've tried it recently and they've had their horses yawning and releasing. And so I think it can be therapeutic, but don't push it, you know, don't want it too badly. Don't kind of need to, um, to feel a horse in that way because, um, you know, your horse will feel that and that will just make them even more anxious. So go sensitively and, you know, notice the areas in, in your horse that um, are difficult for it, you know, why is your horse sensitive around its head or around its ears? Maybe it's holding some unmet trauma there. Maybe there's something um, in its physiology, some patterns, some unconditional forces that are, are being held there that it doesn't know how to dissipate and it doesn't know how to get rid of. And that's why it's sensitive in that area. A uh, good question here from Doromy. If you're mm -hmm. working with a horse in a yard or a stable with stable mates and mm -hmm. other horses, do you find the others begin to connect, particularly yeah. as the heart feel is so large? Yeah, definitely. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, they will come and stand really close to the walls. Um, you know, they're like, oh, I want to be a part of that. You know, they really understand it, especially exactly absolutely right around the heart field stuff. And sometimes, really strangely, I'll be working with one horse but, and I can kind of get a sense of what's going on for the horse next door. It happened to me um, a couple of weeks ago. I was working with a very high performance dressage horse and his stable ne mate next door has a problem with his feet and I could really feel that. And I, you know, said to the owner, you know, you might want to just recommend that that horse has a, has a treatment maybe, or has, um, you know, she said, yeah, he has a problem with his feet. And I said, actually, I, I think that the horse that I was working at was kind of bothered by the other horse's problem with its feet. Um, so, you know, it can be quite interesting. Certainly when we want run our, our post-grad um, uh, workshops here on the farm, we have numerous different animals here and they'll often all sort of come in towards the stable yard and um, we have some llamas and they'll end up kind of sitting right by the stable yard. I think, you know, animals just inherently know a, a good space and, and they're very drawn to it. Um, if we mix another couple of questions here. If you have a very nervous, anxious horse, do you work at a slight distance just in the field before making contact? Absolutely. And the other question was actually asking, do you do long distance healing with horses? Okay, um, so yes, I do work um, to settle the horse. So I'm gonna sort of answer the second part of that question first. I don't actually do distance um, healing. Um, I believe it can be done. Um, I'm a craniosacral therapist and I like um, the fact that it's very relational work and that it's a touch-based therapy. And for, so for me, um, that's important. Um, so I actually don't do the distance healing, although I feel like I, I could, but it's just not, not really my bag. Um, and yes, if a horse is very anxious, then absolutely, I will take the time that it takes um, to settle with that horse. And like I say, that can be over a couple of sessions. I certainly, um, treat a, a horse who is a rescued horse. Um, he was a Saudi Arabian racehorse that was uh, brought over to this country. And we had probably two or three sessions um, of me just holding the space and, and really allowing him to settle before I could bring my hands in because he had such a strong pattern around his SBJ that his head, it was really hard for him. Um, to have any contact. So yeah, I really respect that. That's, that's really important. We must respect that. Um, otherwise, we're just, um, you know, we're not really doing craniosacral therapy um, and we're sort of wanting it to be something different. We must honour um, and gain the trust of the horse in, in order to listen on such a deep level. Um, question here from Linda, and it's actually come up from earlier from a few other people. 
Um, there's a special relationship between horses and people, but is CST appropriate with other domesticated animals? Any idea? And yeah, for sure. I was asking about cats earlier. Okay. Um, so absolutely. I think um, as long as something has a living physiology, it can benefit from cranial. Um, I think there's a big difference between working with horses and let's say dogs or cats, because dogs and cats are in our houses. Um, so when I, I certainly um, treat some dogs and, um, you know, I like to treat my own dogs occasionally, and they just feel much closer and they don't have such a wide connection to the wider fields in my experience. Um, but they'll, and they'll certainly sync up with us much quicker because they're living in our houses with us. Um, and I think it's around that, but yeah, absolutely. Any animal can benefit. Um, if you're cranially trained, just try it. You know, if you have a cat or a dog, just lightly, maybe when you're sitting down, they're sitting close to you, just, just put your hands on and, and see how they respond. See if you, what you sense in their system. And if you notice them really dropping, I mean, to a really deep stillness. I certainly, you know, when I treat one of my dogs, she will just snore um, as soon as I start working cranially. Interestingly, we've just rescued um, another little dog and um, I was working with her the other day cranially and her system is actually really, really tight. So I'm gonna be um, doing some more work with her um, over the next few weeks. Um, in your experience, do you find that still points in horses last longer than with humans or about the same? I think it, it varies. Um, some horses systems will take up the opportunity to drop into a, a still point and you know you can be there holding it for really the majority of the session. And other times um, it'll move through quite quickly and it's like they, they sort of don't need so, so much of a, a still point. For me, a still point is um, you know, it's a bit like a sort of reboot to the system in many ways. And, and you know, I just trust whatever I hold that that's, that's right for the horse. And, you know, once I feel a, a fluid motion again, you know, I, I, I'm like, okay, well, that was enough. Um, you know, I'm not gonna go on trying to force a still point. There's a couple of questions again, just to put together here, Edwina, from David and Mark. Um, in the wild, do horses find a way to resolve trauma do they help each other in a, in some kind of way yeah and yeah i truly believe that horses um who live in herds in the wild that social engagement between them can be um you know really important for them and and but you know i i think in the wild there's probably less trauma that you know certainly they don't have the same interaction with people so they will wean naturally so you know that won't be so traumatic for them um yeah maybe being chased by a lion will really activate them it'll be a short sharp amount of trauma but then you know they'll go off and they'll graze and they'll hang out together and they'll groom each other and th that social engagement will really help to down regulate their nervous system so i have to say i've never worked with a wild horse um i'd love to have the opportunity to get close to a herd of wild horses and really feel what that what that felt like um, but i think they probably do resolve their their trauma um, you know, because they can activate their flight response, they can gallop, they can run, they can do what they need to do. So it's not going to um, overwhelm their system and get trapped in the same way. Um, question here from Monique. During your teaching, when you're training in, in, on your training, um, cranial sacral horse equine training, mm -hmm. um, how do the horses accept so many um, therapists practicing with them? So we're really careful about that. Um, we really um, give them lots of breaks. I'm actually really lucky that um, one of my clients brings in a couple of her horses. So we have, you know, it's not all on my horses and we just time out, take time out for them. And I'm really monitoring that. You know, I know if they're cooked, then I'll, I'll say no more for this horse. You know, that's enough um, because it's really important. You know, um, it's my horse's well-being and health um, is, is paramount to me. Um, so I'm just monitoring that all the time and we're really careful to make sure that, that we don't overstep the mark with that. So um, Edwina, thank you. We're just coming up towards the end. There's been lots of other, of other questions. Sorry if we haven't managed to get to them. Um, perhaps just you, you would um, like to sort of name what is the process of joining an equine training because that's okay. coming up with a few people. Um, 
So I think you can get in touch with me. My email address is going to come up, I think, after this, um, or you can um, maybe contact CTET and get in touch with me through that. Um, Penel Meredith, who I run the course with, actually, she, she um, does all the admin. So, um, but I think for the purpose of that, get in touch with me and, and then I can um, pass you on to Penel. And also just want to say, if anybody has any questions that they don't feel answered that, you know, I'd be really happy to be in, you know, do be in touch with me and I'll see how I can help you. And your horse. That's great. Edwina, that's so wonderful. Thank you so much. Lots of Thank really you. lovely comments as well which hopefully you'll, you'll get to have a look at after just people thanking you. They really loved it, really enjoyed it this evening. Um, it just really comes through your love of horses and, and how you work with them is, is wonderful to watch. It, you know, we can really, I could really feel it through here. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much. It's well, been thank you. And thank you everybody for listening. Um, I really appreciate it. And, you know, may the horse be with you. <laughs>